Hello, my name is Bohem Rolich, and I'm going to talk about the work that I have done together with Alereza Malik and Christopher Yuli from Uppsala University. And the title of my talk is Bedrock and Fractures on Delineation Using Different Near Surface Artic Sources. It's a bit of a long title, but I'm hoping that by the end of my talk, you will get to the point. The outline of my talk is in the beginning where I'm going to introduce the site and motivation behind the survey go over the acquisition methodology and the sources used, used for testing, show some data examples, go towards the reflection seismic processing and the results of the reflection seismic processing and tomography results, and in the end, summarize the whole story and get some conclusions out. The test site is located north of Uppsala city in central Sweden and has been used as a student teaching site for various purposes. And there are several boreholes drilled at the site, including a small windmill and a meteorological station. The site is therefore used for different hydrological, hydrogeological tests, meteorological studies, as a teaching site for applied geophysics, of course, and also for a geophysical well logging demonstration. From a geological perspective, we have granitic bedrock overlaid by 0 to 20 meters of glacial clay, steels, and moraines. During one of the hydrological tests in one of the boreholes at the site, an excess water flow was noted which indicated a possibility of a fracture zone. Therefore, our main objective is to delineate the bedrock and the fracture zone using different seismic sources and a three-component digital-based salt plan streamer and find what would be the optimal source for these targets. During the Applied Geophysics course in 2012, this borehole where the excess water flow was noted was geophysically logged, and we can see the green arrow showing at the fracture location, and it can be seen both in natural gamma, resistivity, velocity, and the sonic loss. To talk a bit about data acquisition, we used a star type array centered around this load borehole, and we had our east-west oriented seismic land streamer. It is a three component MEMS based seismic land streamer. MEMS stands for microelectromechanical system, and compared to geophones, there are three component broadband sensors. The, uh, the streamer itself has five segments with 100 sensors. Every segment consists of 20 units mounted on sleds connected by non-stretchable cargo straps, which you can see to my left. The, se the segments by themselves are interconnected by small trolleys carrying a power unit. And four segments have two meter unit spacing, while the fifth segment has four meter unit spacing. The second element of our star array type with three wireless lines oriented northwest, southeast, north south, and northeast southwest. All the lines had approximately 40 wireless seismic recorders spaced four meters, and every fourth unit was a three component MEMS based unit. Except for the MEMS based units, the other wireless recorders were connected to single component 10 hertz vertical geophones, and they were operating in passive mode, mode acquiring data continuously, and at a later stage, the data from the wireless recorders was merged with the land streamer recorded data using GPS timestamps of the individual shots. We decided to do the data collection at the end of January 2017 to ensure that the ground coupling would be ideal. And the average temperature was about zero degrees and we used a satellite system to acquire the data. We can see how the wireless sensor is planted in the ground, people acquiring the data and our land streamer in the middle and other, other seismic lines in the field. For the sources, we tested four different seismic sources. One was five kilograms sledgehammer vertically striking aluminum plate, which is shown here with the blue arrow. Second source tested is a metallic I-beam profile hit laterally. Basically, you stand on it, you hit it two times from this side, you turn the opposite way, you hit it two times on the opposite side, and you induce the ASH waves. The next source tested was a commercially available accelerated weight drop, striking a metallic plate vertically. And the last source tested is called Udarnik, which is a joint design of Uppsala University and an independent company from Serbia. The Udarnik is a new source. I feel that I should give a few words about it. And it is a vertical type impact source with two hammers successfully striking a metal plate beneath every hammer. At every sort location, when the source is moved, it needs to 
be lowered down by a handle uh, to put the source down from it to the ground. And how it functions and how it works is that electromagnetic force of static coil one, which is shown here by static coil, causes a hammer to connect via seesaw to hit the bottom metal plate. So the successive hitting is achieved by changing the rules of coil one and coil two, which causes successive hits. We can see to the left how the how the Udenik looks like without any cover, and to our right how it looks in, in the field. And some technical specifications. It is based on this concept. Maximum number of uh, hits per second is 18. It can be used R24 36 volt power supply. The maximum sweep length can be up to 40 seconds, both up and down. The sweep shape is controlled via USB software and it is about 180 kilos, can be controlled either remotely or manually. And we can see how it actually looks like, and we can see an example of our sweep. So we can see the hammer striking successively the two plates on the side. Okay, moving on from Arudarnik to some actual data results, we can see a comparison of the vertical component of the sledgehammer and an accelerated weight drop. We can see similar signal characteristics, slightly more noise on the accelerated weight drop, which is likely connected to the wind, not the source itself. Looking at the amplitude spectra, we have the same frequencies. If we look at our SH source and the result of our SH component, not much data can be seen there. But surprisingly, if we compare the vertical component, although we were hitting laterally the meta I beam, we can see we can see quite a good data quality. So then we decided to use this for later processing purposes. However, when it was time to test Udernik, the temperatures rose and suddenly everything turned from excellent ground conditions into this. The field just became mud and the ground conditions changed so much that it was no more a valid comparison of the sources. But yet again, we decided to continue and do what we can. If we look at an example of the data from Udanik, we can see our one and two hammers. We can see a zoom in of, the, of some of the hits. For the test purposes, we used a 14 seconds long, long uh, record with a 12 seconds long sweep with an increasing hit rate from one to 12 hits. However, at the later stage when we finished the field, we realized that we, that we could not retrieve our final signal, which caused further problems for later processing. And again, since the, the, the fields turned into mud, we could use our Udarnik source only on a limited portion of the entire land streamer profile. So we had to skip the two portions marked by the red circles the map. After some time and some processing, we use the shift and stack principle to, to stack the individual hits. And since we could not retrieve the pilot signal, we ended up using only half of the actual collect. If we compare our vertical component shown to the left and our SV component shown to, shown to the right, we can see relatively clear P-wave press breaks on the vertical. And we can see something that looks like S-wave first breaks and then S-wave reflection on the S-wave component. If we compare the data from all four sources used at the site and look at only the vertical component of the seismic land streamer, we can look that all four sources show similar signal characteristics with the P-wave press rivals clearly seen. We can see a bit more ground roll on Udernik, but that's mostly just due to change of the ground conditions. If we focus our analysis now on the top 150 milliseconds and look at the raw data, we can see a hyperbolic event shown with the red arrows on all the sources. Now, if we do some elementary processing, just a simple band pass filtering, mute the first arrivals and convert it to depth, we get the results of our reflection seismic processing and we can see the stacks of all four sources shown below. Looking at the blue arrows indicating the bedrock reflector, we can see that it is well delineated. 
And then if we look at the red arrows pointing at the fracture zone, we can see that that one is also relatively well delineated. The stack sections themselves show similar signal properties with Udarnik showing the poorest result, but which is again, most likely related to change of the ground conditions. And we could use it only along the portion of our, of our actual sound line due to ground changes. Additionally to the comparison of sources along the streamer, we use the sledgehammer shooting along all three wireless lines that were located in the field. And uh, the P-Wave first travels were picked on total 224 receivers with 160 sources used and with a number of uh, P-Wave first travels, about 36,000. We used ps tone code to invert the data with cell sizes of two meters both in X, Y, and Z direction. And after six iteration, we obtained the RMS error of 2.8 milliseconds. Looking now at our tomography results, we can see our 3D, 3D tomography model shown here. We can see the white bar in the center showing depth of bedrock at our borehole of interest and the red bar showing the, fracture, the, the depth of fracture. And we can see that the tomography model simply did not penetrate deep enough and did not go to the fracture zone itself. But uh, looking at the white bar, we can see quite well delineated uh, undulating bedrock topography. If we compare this with our reflection seismic result, we can see that the tomography result matches quite well with our reflection seismic result. If we now Scroll, scroll through a few slices in the east-west direction from a 3D tomography model and compare that versus a reflection seismic section. We can see the black bars indicating drill depth to bedrock along the site and a red bar indicating the location of a fracture zone. If we go through a few slices, we can see that the bedrock is quite well delineated and it has an undulating topography. And we can see that the fracture zone is also, also nicely showing up in our data. To summarize the whole story, all sources show similar signal properties, with the sledgehammer appearing to be a good source for these kind of targets. Our Udardic source shows promising results on both P and S wave side data. However, some modifications are needed to make it more effective in the field. Both our tomography and reflection seismic results appear successful in imaging the bedrock and fracture zone located at the site. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and provide some references here, the key references necessary to follow up the background of the presentation. And if you like this presentation, please visit the EAG YouTube channel for more e-lectures. Thank you again.